Hey, Chris. Hey, Drew. Have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? Why, yes, I have. When we were trying to get this podcast off the ground, we had a lot of questions. Like, how do I record an episode? How do I get my show into all the apps people like to listen to? Um, how do we make money podcasting? The answer to every one of these questions is really simple. Anchor. Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing your podcast. And best of all, it's 100% free and ridiculously easy to use. And now, Anchor can match you with great sponsors who want to advertise on your podcast. That means you can get paid to podcast right away. Uh, in fact, that's what I'm doing right now just by reading this ad. Right now? Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now? That means if you want to get a podcast going and make money doing it, Go to anchor.fm slash start. Join me and Chris and the diverse community of podcasters already using Anchor. That's anchor.fm slash start. We can't wait to hear your podcast. What makes you afraid? Some of All Fear lives at the crossroads between our greatest phobias and the horror movies we love to experience. Part pop culture and part psychology, it's time to find out why we're all so scared of the dark. Yeah, it's always, it's always good when we start a podcast and, and then you get a phone call right in the middle because you forgot to put it on airplane mode. I was too enthusiastic anyways. Well, you were re- you were like overly excited about your podcast. I am overly excited <laughs> about my podcast. How am I supposed to damn? Not it? your podcast. Let's get this straight. Podcast you listen to. My my personal favorite podcast. Not our podcast. Well, I mean, I'm very enthusiastic about ours too. But um... <laughs> well, you listen to so you listen to a lot of of you like the comedian podcast. You like the I like the and Dr. you like Drew. and you like yeah the brain the brain he stuff. He has podcasts. Ron Burgundy, the new podcast. Have you listened to it yet? I did. It's on true crime. You should listen to it. Is I it found good? it pretty funny. Um, I I'm interested to see how far they can take it before it just gets old. Mm. Um, but I just I just love Ron Burgundy so much. That's awesome. Here I... goes Scotch. Scotchy, scotch, 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 scotch. Down into I'm not my drinking belly. scotch. I'm mm, drinking. Mm, mm, but it's an afternoon right now. By the way, we are we are podcasting in the afternoon. Yeah, we've this got is a like new, no time. Lately. This is a new thing for us. We're trying to squeeze this in between the end of our work day and the beginning of your roller derby practice. Yeah. Um. So it's it's uh, this is a new this is a new deal for us. Yeah, very new. But my podcast, I like horror podcasts. Um, Surprise. Yeah, we listen to I listen to Shockwaves, which is a great one. Um, a lot of the Blumhouse people, Ryan Turek, uh, the guy who, I think he was the producer of Halloween, the new Halloween, and uh, Rebecca McKendry and, and um, Elric Kane, and there's, it's a great podcast. Those guys know their horror shit, man. On Sunday, you introduced me to the Horror Virgin, which I really I like that one. I love it. I loved their breakdown of um, Happy Death Day. Yeah. I thought their interplay was hilarious and it was it was a good yeah, one. Yeah, I mentioned that on Twitter because I, I really like that one. It's really a great it's a great concept. I, I reminds me of we have a friend who uh, Dave who's a who's a who's a, a horror virgin that literally like Poltergeist scarred him so much as a child that he like won't watch any horror movies. I highly um, recommended Poltergeist to him though, and I think yeah. he would. Well, Poltergeist is a little different. There's there's there is a difference in like horror that like scares you and horror that's just stupid and, right. and ridiculous. But then I always fall back on the typical psychology ones the hilarious world of depression is great um terrible thanks for asking is another good one um yeah your your your, your podcasts are very you have a, you have an eclectic group but you really stick to comedians and but, like, and brain and mental health but one that really cross sections both is getting better with ron funches that doesn't cross section both it does because it's about getting oh is it better. it's about bettering <laughs> it's about... yourself um and about just finding something in a, in a way or listening to someone um that is trying to better themselves in some way and it's very inspiring and i, I, don't I know. like it i think i think since he's gotten skinny uh, I think he's got some attitude now, and I don't like it. I, I don't think, appreciate it. I think you have a chip on your shoulder. I think I like I like fat Ron Funches better. I think and, you're jealous and um, maybe a little green with envy. What, that he lost weight? Yeah. Why Why would that be green with envy? Are you calling me fat? Yes. Is that what you just did? <laughs> did you just call me Ron Funches fat? Damn. No, not Ron Funches fat. Damn. <laughs> what a bitch. 
Oh, well, I was welcome. saying you were envious of his podcast success, but <laughs> I'm glad that you finally like uh, reconciled something with yourself. Jeez. God. God. Damn. All right. Well, welcome, Feardos. Hey, Feardos. You didn't say that the right way. You're supposed to you have that, that voice. Feardos. <laughs> Uh, thanks for tuning in again. This is uh, episode seven of our uh, our podcast oh, on, uh, and we're going to be talking about uh, uh, agoraphobia, which uh, or agoraphobia. Gor- I've always heard it called agoraphobia, but every time I heard it pronounced, it was it was agoraphobia. Um, but uh, how yeah. is it spelled? Uh, A G O R A. Okay, so say it the first way. Agra. Okay. Or agora. Or the two different ways. Agoraphobia. Agoraphobia. Agoraphobia is the way I heard it. Agor- agoraphobia. <clears throat> yeah, so thanks for listening, guys. We're, we're so, we're, we're, we're happy that we're on our, our seventh episode. We've it's moved, incredible. We're moving right along. We stuck um, with something for seven times. I know, I'm kind of amazed. I'm Woo, actually, high five. I'm actually, I've actually already kind of uh, like been like, are we really going to keep this thing going? This is a lot of work every week. Like, I don't know. Like You've got baseball coming up. You're oh gosh. coaching a majors <sighs> team. It's dude, this, this baseball stuff is ridiculous. Like it's coaching coaching any athletic like kids athletics is is a time sucker, but coaching like once you get up to like the kids when they're starting to be like better, you know, and you actually have to really start coaching, it is ridiculous how much time it's it, it, i love it i really enjoy it i like baseball i like coaching kid, kids is is really rewarding and it's fun but people don't damn understand it, it is a lot of work how much volunteer time yeah, there's, goes a, into lot it. Of, there's, there's a, a lot of there's a lot of time. it but you know yeah. what your boys appreciate it and they see it and that's something they're going to translate into their families when they grow up i hope so so i hope they appreciate know. it I, know, I, good know they, modeling. I know they appreciate it i think good be, modeling good job honey oh thanks honey you're welcome <laughs> Um, but thanks for tuning in guys. Um, just a real quick, uh, you know, beginning of the show deal, uh, check out our social media. We're on, uh, Facebook at some of all fear podcast. We are on Twitter at some of all fear pod P O D. Uh, what else we're on Instagram? We have an Instagram now. Um, some of all fear podcast as well. No, at some of all fear pod also, I think, um, but check it out. We're on there somewhere. Um, you put us everywhere. Yeah, we're all over the place, and we're getting a, we're getting some really good um, you know feedback. We're getting a lot of good. And like, I've been researching some merch, ooh, some ideas for merch, um, and some companies that will do the general printing. To and like drop the drop shipping. The drop type shipping. Deal. Yeah, nice. at least in the beginning. That'd be fun. While we're growing, but I I would like a t shirt. You know how much of a fanatic about t shirts I am. Yeah, it'd be great to have some t shirts. Maybe we'll do that soon. I would or love to get some stuff. Yeah, or hats and t shirts. You need another black hat. We need to we need to we need to motivate people. <laughs> We apparently need to motivate people to rate us and review us and, and write a comment. The, thanks to those who have recently. Yeah, we only have like seven. We only have like seven rankings on on Apple, and I know there's more of you listening on Apple because I see the statistics. That's seven more than we've ever had, though. I know, but we need more. I really would appreciate it, even if they're shitty. I would rather have shitty ones. And just to to have you interact and and rate and rank us. Are then, you seeking then, approval right now? Well, it's just a good. I like it. <laughs> I like seeing new ones pop up, and I check it every day. Aww. And and there won't be like a new one for like for like a week, and I'll be like, oh, there's one little rating that popped up. Please. So give... if you're listening, rate us and review us, and and leave us a little a little review, especially if you're friends of ours. I'm gonna start getting on you assholes. Aww. Um, we love Because it only you. takes a second. No. no, it only takes a second. There's no excuse. <laughs> Damn it. Um, so, so do that, rate us and leave a review. Um, and, uh, and yeah, check us out on all the, uh, platforms, right? We're on Apple, we're on Google, we're on Stitcher, we're, we're on, on everywhere. Yeah. All over the place. Radio public. Um, we're in everywhere, man. Yeah. So life has been busy. So busy. Crazy we, stuff. We came back from New Orleans and it was like zero to 600 now. Yeah. Chris got like a promotion. Well, got, didn't got, get a promotion. She, got, she got a new, she got a new position, which was really, really important because it was stressing her out big time. Yeah. And I found out, my, you know, that like maybe things weren't great, my job position. Um, and so we went, we like switched places. Yeah. And it, it was like night and day that day. But um, so if you're out there listening and, and you need some content uh, for your website, uh, uh, let me know because I, I content or marketing or PR, uh, that's, uh, that's my, my deal. So let me know if you need, <laughs> if you need anybody Back in up. those positions. Um, I could use, I could use a little, uh, yeah, a little job back up here soon. 
Um, have you watched any movies this week? I think I fell asleep to a couple, but I've been very you fall asleep to a lot tired. Of we watched... I did make the boys watch Anna and the Apocalypse, though. Yes. Despite its R rating, okay, I checked the content on IMDb, and the only issue was that, A, it was bloody gory, and we've had this discussion with our children about bloody gory TV and fake versus reality um, and real trauma versus fake trauma, Um So don't get all sensitive on me. (laughs) Um, And there was one bout of kissing and both children were like, me, of course. And then Um, there's there's a lot of, there's a lot of shits and fucks and, uh, and, and various, various cussing. And it's not like they haven't heard that from one or both parents. At various times. At various times. No, I I really, I think they both really enjoyed it. They both had this real weird fascination with death. I wonder why. Um, (laughs) With their parents, and they both like musicals, especially yeah. the little one. He, yeah, he kept singing the songs after. Yeah, they were they were super super excited about uh, about about all that part. Um, but yeah, I really enjoy that movie. That is a really great movie. It would have made it absolutely would have made my top ten for last year if I had seen it in time. Right, it, it came out in December, but I didn't see it till January, and it did not. It just didn't make it on because I I hadn't seen it yet, and and it was really really good. I have several of the. Songs. It was wait. Do you remember what I called it? No. What my description was high school oh. musical meets Shaun of the Dead. Yes, I've been using that <laughs> to tell everyone because it's such an accurate description. It's the perfect it's perfect description it's for great. that movie. It's probably somebody probably already said it and I probably heard it somewhere else. And, I love and then the music it. so much. Like I listen to it on my playlist at work every day. It's really good. And I think I've seen I don't know if I've watched much else. Um Lots of reruns this week. Kind yeah. of mindless. Yeah, stuff. mindless shit. Because I just haven't been in yeah, I've been been so busy and tired and I get home. But what's your favorite kind of rerun, Drew? Shut up. <laughs> I watch sitcom reruns, all right? I like them. You know, Parks and Rec, How I Met I Your love Mother. Parks and Rec, though. Um, what Brooklyn else? Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Brooklyn Nine-Nine, yeah. Nine-Nine. Yeah, so we, we are definitely a sitcom sitcom rerun people when, but, we, when we need something mindless in the yeah. background, for sure. But we're definitely in a bit of a show hole, right? Yeah. Yeah, there hasn't been anything popping like new show-wise. No. Um, so send us your suggestions because... I mean, the Ted Bundy tapes, you liked that. Oh, that was good. It yeah, was you, interesting. Yeah, it was good. I liked the Ted Bundy But it's Bundy not really tape. a show. It's like a documentary. Yeah, you know? that was it's good. a little different. That'll, that'll relate to our, uh, to, our, to our feature presentation today. Because oh. we're going to be doing, we're gonna be doing like the serial killer uh, route um, for our feature today. Which, you know, I, I just, you know... Oh, there's a, there's a podcast that I listen to all the time. Uh, last Podcast. Yes. That's I why. love Last Podcast. Yeah. I'm sure there's plenty of people who listen to that one uh, out there um, in our Feardo land. Um, but yeah, the serial killer stuff is, I always, I always find that fascinating. And the, and you know, that was an interesting one because it was a lot of, I mean, I, I felt like, you know, it didn't dive in super deep, but it definitely gave you some of those like interviews and that stuff that, you know, some of that real real news clip stuff that was really interesting. So I that kind that. of psychology was my trajectory through, you know, my entire schooling um, until I decided to stay at my university. And they obviously didn't have like a forensic track or something like that. So I did something that was broadly applicable, you know, yeah. therapy, um, you wanted, a very you wanted to broad analyze, clinical license. You wanted to be Clarice, didn't you? I wanted to be Clarice Starling. <laughs> she was like my inspiration because of how how she could see through everything and kind of see to the heart of people, even if they projected no heart. Um, yeah. So, yeah. You know, and I think it's, I think um, uh, that kind of dovetails into something that I wanted to, to bring up in this intro a little bit. Uh, you know, I think, I think it's really important that we, that we talk about the fact that we are really, Big proponents of of mental health awareness. Oh, absolutely! And making sure that your your awareness yeah, support support um, crisis intervention support anybody who's in you know the mental health field, even if you're not, um, you know, seek out volunteer work. You don't have to have a license to be trained in mental health crisis prevention. Um, it's just it's so needed yeah. nowadays. Yeah, I mean, and we, we know there's a crisis. You know, we know there's a major crisis, and um, so maybe at some point, you know, it'd be really cool if at some point maybe we'll get a Patreon or something like that, and maybe we can give a percentage to to one of the big, you know, mental health awareness 
um, groups or, or something or maybe, like that. Or maybe, yeah, yeah, some sort of a group that really um, supports mental health awareness or um, education, yeah. too. Yeah, one of these days, down the road, hopefully, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get something If you have like any ideas, going. let us know. Yeah. Um, we would love we to team would... up with you. Like, if, you have, if you're part of that, that circle somewhere, um, yes. you know, we would love to, to figure out how to, you know, how to use this for... For good and not for evil. Right, right. We'll talk about the evil. Because I'm a mental health professional <laughs> and, and we find this topic interesting. But, you know, obviously this is a podcast. It's not meant for professional help. But it doesn't mean that we don't support seeking of professional help. Absolutely. And, you know, helping to improve quality of life um, no matter what you're suffering from. For sure. So with that, I would like for you to not improve my mental health. Um, stomp on my mental health. <laughs> Make my mental health uh, really, really sad. What is depress, it? Really, are you ready to depress me some more? I've seen you very depressed lately. I don't think you need to be Aww, more I'm not that depressed. depressed. Maybe a little bit. You're a little down. I've been a little down. And it bums me out because I know... I know, A, I'm a rescuer, so I'll try and rescue you even though you don't need rescuing. And two, there's nothing to rescue from yet. Do, do you hear that, kids? You hear that? Is that the sound of your life raft? That's the sound of whiskey. <laughs> the whiskey life whiskey raft? Whiskey is not a prescribed mental health... Uh, it's, it's not a prescribed antidepressant? No, it's actually a depressant. No, I, I don't think so. I think pretty sure you're wrong about that. I'm pretty sure your brain is... Because when I, when I, when I, drink, the, when I drink this, I feel less depressed. <laughs> So I don't understand how that works. Just because you feel Who makes less up de- these categories. Just because you feel less depression doesn't mean you have less depression. What? Uh, it's like when you take an opiate. Just because you feel less pain doesn't yeah, mean you yeah, have whatever. less pain. Whatever, whatever. You Serotonin, just blah, 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 blah. Less. Bullshit. <laughs> Blood sugar, blah, blah. Man, uh, you are right. so relaxing in denial. I am ready for what the fear. Okay. Are you ready for America's favorite? Phobia-based trivia game. What the fear? You say it now. What the fear? There you go. Okay, you have to say it like that. All right. It's time for What the Fear. Are you ready to bring me way down? Way down deeper, deeper, deeper into this hole? Deeper. Deeper. Into the boring hole. The hole of despair. This boring hole of despair. <laughs> Hashtag your boring holes. Post them on our website. <laughs> Didn't you get some from did. Brent? We did. That is so funny. My, my cousin Brent went to uh, went to Boggy Creek, <laughs> which is a famous documentary, slide, like faux documentary horror movie. That's so fabulous. Um, I think it's an, I thought it was an Arkansas. I love I it when, it. when people send us stuff. Yeah. <laughs> boring holes, people. Send us your boring holes. Uh, all, all right. right. Get ready this, to go? Get this, let's get this shit over with. All right, let's do this. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Your first one is Laporiphobia. Laporiphobia. L-E-P-O-R-I phobia. Laporiphobia. That is the fear of your skin flaking off. Whoa, they would be very afraid of my hands. Oh, I know, your poor chemical burn hands. I know, I get to see the dermatologist in a week, though. Oh, yay. So, that's awesome. Is, am I correct? <laughs> no. Oh. Um, you're wrong, <laughs> uh, but I see the leprosy. Yeah, that was what I was going There for. we go. See, I see you. Um, no, it's... <laughs> I love just seeing how your mind works with these. It's like giving you an ink blot test. Yeah, whatever. But better. Uh, <laughs> Um, no, it's a fear of rat- rabbits. The fear of... Oh, you know what? Damn it. I should have known that one. Andy Roddick actually has a really bad phobia of rabbits. I actually knew that that, that prefix had something to do with rabbits, and I, I, I fucked that one up. Where'd you learn that at? I don't know. It was in the back of my brain somewhere. Oh, well... In 2002, um, he was at a brunch and was confronted face-to-face by an Easter bunny. Who is this? Andy Roddick. The tennis player? Yes. Tennis player fame. Um, and got incredibly uncomfortable and then asked the uh, wait staff at the brunch to make sure that the bunny came nowhere near him. Why was there a bunny at brunch? I think it was an Easter brunch. 
So um, getting you still shouldn't have live bunnies jumping around your Easter bunny. No, so not a seems... live bunny. It was a bunny costume, you dork. Oh, costume. Oh, my gotcha. gosh. I was thinking there was bunnies jumping around. I'm like, that no. is not Honey, in keeping with the health you codes. You do know that the Easter bunny is fake, right? No. I'm sorry what? to break this to you. I'm so but sad. But he's not real. <laughs> it's just. Are you sure? It's just your, your mom and I. Oh. <laughs> I'm so glad you guys still keep up the holidays for me. Though. Right? We like to keep the spirit. Mom never told me that, hey. that, that it was fake, so never, she still keeps it up. That was never very... stop playing. <laughs> What's the next one? I already need a refill on my drink, so I'm gonna go wander over while you're telling while you're asking me the next one. What's the next uh, one? I'm trying to read my handwriting. Right, yeah. Come on. Keep it's Riotophobia. Spell it. R H Y. T-I-O phobia. Spell it again. R-H-Y-T-I-O phobia. You gotta keep talking because I'm still making my drink. <laughs> so you need to guess. It's rhytophobia. Rhytophobia. Um You should have been more prepared. Shame. I drank my drink too fast. Don't do that. You'll get sloppy by the movies. Uh. I know. That always happens. I know. It's also four in the afternoon. I know. Gosh. <laughs> this just goes to show my mind oh, yeah, my yeah, mind yeah. right now and where it's at. Rytophobia. R-H-Y-T-I-O-phobia. Oh, yes. yes. If this were a spelling bee, you would have won. Good job. <laughs> oh, that sounds like somebody's name or something. Like it came from like rice or something like R H Y a rheumatoid rye uh, the fear of uh God these are so hard there's like nothing there's like never one where I'm like oh my gosh this is easy if it was easy it wouldn't be fun mm. you could throw me a bone like every now and then chiclelophobia was a pretty close bone yeah chiclets yep <laughs> you said bone. <laughs> You said to throw your bone. <laughs> um, Rytophobia is the fear of skulls. No, it's the fear of wrinkles on your hands. How am I supposed to? How would I ever get even close? I don't to that know. One? I need to start giving me like one hit. But you were kind. You were kind of close with um, joints with rheumatoid with and rheumatoid joints and joints, right? Because the those joints are in located in your hands. Um, are they located other places too? They might be. I, I don't, don't know. know. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> you just play one on not a podcast? A doctor. I just play one on a... No, I don't play a doctor on a podcast. I just play on one on a podcast. I do not. I have never been, nor have I ever claimed to be a doctor. Mm. Um, anyways, <clears throat> so uh, Kristen Bell of we, 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 Everything yes, Fandom. Yes, we, we listened to uh, her husband's podcast. Wife of Dax Shepard. Yeah. Of, I like uh, that guy. Frozen Elsa fame. Yeah. I like Dax too. And Saving Sarah Marshall. Saving Sarah. Oh, God. That movie is so funny. I love her. Um, but she really. No, really. I love her. <laughs> it's Sorry. okay. No, I, I I understand. Like, if she said that she loved you back, I would, you would be okay. You would step aside? I would be okay because you know what? You could never get her name wrong. Because <laughs> it's Kristen? Right. <laughs> You're dork. I know. Uh, but she hates pruny fingers so much that. When she goes into the pools, she'll wear gloves. That's weird. That's it, a weird thing. It's a real dislike for that that, that tactile sensation. Yeah, very strange. Right? Very strange. Never mind. I don't want to marry Kristen Bell. That's weird. oh yay! There can only be one Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and last one for you is cremastrophobia. Cremastra. Phobia. I need to have you start bringing flashcards so you don't have to, to spell them. K-R-E-M-A-S-T-R-A phobia. Cray Mastra phobia. Hmm. The fear of... Hmm. That is... I... Oh gosh. Cray Mass sounds like Christmas. <laughs> Cremastrophobia, like the fear of chewing something, maybe. Chewing? Like masticating. Like masticating? No? Nothing? No. Not even close? No, not no, even. No, no teeth involved. No, I don't even know how you would get Cray this one Cremastrophobia. The fear you, of, all right, the fear of buffalo. 
I was going to give you a hint, but fine. We'll go fear of buffalo is wrong. <laughs> it's not correct. <laughs> I'm going to have to come up with hints to give you. Like, you may have to come up with like one or two because hints. This because is just, it's, getting, it's getting ridiculous It's now. getting boring. It is a little boring. Just Bo- it's getting you. very boring hole. Yeah, boring hole. We've I'm gone a, down the boring the f- hole and we need to recover. I'm so a, what the fear boring, <laughs> boring hole. hole. Um, but pop star Kylie Minogue actually has a fear of coat hangers. Which is Kramer phobia. Coat hangers. Yeah. A she doesn't, fear of coat hangers. She doesn't like to touch them, hear them being put like on their racks or clicking together, and hates how they hide her shoes. Uh, no more wire hangers. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I got to look that up. Give her movie. Mommy Dearest, right? Yep. <laughs> Mommy Dearest. She did so no good. No more wire hangers. I would have a fear of coat hangers after. Do you think maybe she saw that movie? Maybe, maybe that's why. Maybe that doesn't spread. I don't know. I'd have, to, I'd have to really assess her further. That would be a good. That'd be a good movie to cover for some. There's some crazy shit in that movie. Right. That would be a good one. My mom was just watching um, what happened. Whatever happened to Baby Jane, which is another really good old school like scary ass movie. That even she was like, I don't even know why I'm watching this again. It scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. Speaking of your mom, she's very. Uh, intimately aware of our fear for today. Yes, very aware. Um, and had a really great conversation with her uh, this afternoon. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know if I'll end up put, playing any clips from it because I did record it and was able to like upload the clips into Anchor. But um, we'll see if any of the clips kind of fit, you know, in certain places. But wow, learned a lot about you know stuff that some stuff that I knew about family history and then some stuff about her history that I didn't know. Um, but yeah, she is very agoraphobic, which it's, is our phobia for today. It's amazing, um, what you can find out about someone in their history just by asking what they're afraid of. Yeah. It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, um, so should I go right into our phobia? Yeah, go for it. All right. So our phobia is to, for today is agoraphobia. Agoraphobia is a really, really interesting etymology. I found it really, really fascinating. It's from the Greek, as all phobias all are, are, apparently. Are there any that are not? I don't think so. Why is it? Why? I wonder why that is. I mean, Greek is the foundation is a foundation for a lot of of of, of our language, but... But a lot of these words also came about in modern times. Why weren't they Latin? You know, what is it about the Greek? Maybe it's just a medical thing? Maybe it just sounds cooler? I don't know. Weird. Um, but it comes <laughs> from the Greek... Um, ag- agara. Agora? Agara. Aga, agara. Ag-a-ra, I think, is the Greek pronunciation. <laughs> um, which means gathering place or gathering of people. Mm-hmm. Quite literally... Um, this could be translated as the fear of the marketplace. Mm-hmm. Um, and agoraphobia, I think, for for our purposes, we've most people understand it as the fear of open or like crowded places. Right. Correct. Yeah. But it's so much fucking bigger <laughs> than that. Like, I mean, so much more broad and so much bigger than just those specific things right definitely yeah it covers a lot more than that yeah tell us tell us a little <laughs> bit about this phobia that i honestly this is a, this is a really uh interesting one for me because i i spent a lot of time growing up with uh, an intimate knowledge of this phobia so this is a really really cool one a cool episode so what you need to know is that there's actually two variations that tend to show up of agoraphobia. One is agoraphobia with panic disorder, which is consistent with having uh, more frequent panic attacks than um, than usual. Um, and the other one is uh, just related to agoraphobia with anticipatory anxiety uh, related to future panic attacks. So thinking about... Having a panic attack in public brings on brings, brings on, on a panic, panic attack absolutely without even being in public. Right. Um, there's a huge genetic component to this, and and we know that genetics does play a role in the susceptibility for um, 
anxiety and phobic disorders to develop. But of course, there's always that environmental piece that plays a role. Sure. Um, but research has actually gotten to um, a point where they can pin point genetic susceptibility related to chromosome 1 and 11Q. Uh, so if you have this um, susceptibility on these chromosomes, it means that you have a natural disposition towards um, presenting as agoraphobic and therefore you're more vulnerable to developing agoraphobia. So is that specific to agoraphobia? Yes. Wow. Yeah. So that, I didn't know that. So I, I was assuming there was probably a genetic disposition to being phobic in general but it's not it's a disposition towards this particular phobia yep. one and 11 q there's apparently something with those chromosomes that if there is um a change or or something is way beyond me obviously but um yeah if it, if they can pinpoint it so you can actually run a genetic test that will tell you how susceptible you are to a panic disorder specifically agoraphobia wow that's really interesting because knowing my my family history and we'll talk about that here soon um that makes so much sense you know it's 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 kind of a nature nurture thing too mm -hmm. where where you see that there's definitely some sort of predisposition yeah but there's also triggers right right there's things environmental that, triggers there's things that get that active yeah you know and sometimes they lay dormant and sometimes they never become active and sometimes they never were there to begin with but a uh, situation creates them um, and then from that point on your genetics are passed down to your future generations so they become susceptible to the at that as well wow um, so there is a very strong component with agoraphobia specifically Interesting. It, it affects two um, to about 6% of the population between the ages of 15 and 35. So about six and a half million Americans suffer from agoraphobia. So it's one of those, it's one of those like aerophobia or mm -hmm. those, it's, that's a, a very common phobia. And it does seem to be kind of one of those phobias that's a bit of a catch-all, right? In, in, in the mental health field that it's kind of, you know, people tend to, to maybe attribute it to people that don't necessarily have it like or, 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 or have it. It's maybe another phobia that they kind of relate to agoraphobia. It has, it has a lot of non-classical presentations. Right. Um, but what we do know from the studies that ha have been done is that it's similar across racial and ethnic groups in the U.S. Really? So the experience and the rates of experience of agoraphobia are similar huh. despite um, race or ethnicity. Um, and about 40% of the people that suffer from agoraphobia suffer debilitating levels of symptoms. What was the percentage? 40%. 40% debilitating. Debilitating symptoms. Wow. Debilitating levels. Were they, and explain what, the, what debilitating symptoms would be like. Like what does that, what does that entail? Um, that would entail things like never wanting to leave uh, home or safe spaces, um, over or like hyper vigilance when out uh, beyond those that safe space needing somebody to walk or carry with them um in order to feel safer out of their safe space um gosh it could really prevent you from doing a lot of things in life like just working normal just normal everyday just stuff. everyday living so the concept of a shut in a lot of times is related to as opposed to like if you're handicapped near a shut in that's one thing but if you're if you're a shut-in that is that is healthy, other than you're not leaving home, is almost always associated with agoraphobia. Correct? No, I can't say almost. I can't say almost always, but it would be worth exploring further whether or not that that symptom of being a shut-in is related to anxiety or not. And then you can go from there and see if it actually well, is agoraphobia. Who else is going to stay home all the time and not ever want to leave their house if they're not phobic of the outside world, right? I mean, germaphobes. Well, that's true. But can't that can't that present itself as agoraphobia as well? Like you're not, you don't want to go out because you're you're afraid of interacting with people. But think about how this would differ because if you were a germaphobe and not agoraphobic. Um, if somebody from the outside world were to come into your world or bring you outside goods from inside, you would have to decontaminate them in order to feel safe, right? True. Whereas an agoraphobic wouldn't be they wouldn't care if you came inside. as persistent about that you because inside. you're in their safe space. Right, right. So that there's some differences, which is why you have to look, which is why the professionals have to look further um, into things and kind of figure out what's the root here, what's really kind of 
uh, causing this anxiety that presents as this sim- this cluster of symptoms. So what is what is the main characteristic of somebody who's a, who's agro or agoraphobic? Um, that th- what's the reason why they they have a hard time in in crowds in open spaces? Um, there's a certain there's a certain thing I'm I'm trying to pull out of you. Mm-hmm. I know. Um, what is that thing? Picking up what you're putting down. Yeah. <laughs> um, 42% of the folks that are diagnosed with agoraphobia had a history of real or feared separation from their primary caregivers. So we're talking about a large impact of the aftermath of unresolved separation anxiety. Primary caregivers as in like parents? Parents. And what about what about the other half? Because I think there's there's that right. So there's this separation anxiety, mm-hmm. right, where you feel like you feel isolated and alone. You're scared to be in that situation. But there's also the fear of of something happening while you're in those situations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? yeah. Which, which I think is a, is, a, is even a larger majority For sure. of agoraphobics, right? Yes. Yeah, so we see the the other agoraphobics who struggle to be out in public places because of a feared response while out there. So for instance, I'm out in public and maybe I'm feeling nauseous and I'm afraid that I'm going to throw up and that that's going to be an embarrassing thing to happen. And so it's interesting. So diving into a little bit of my family situation, right? So my, my mother is agoraphobic, diagnosed um, as long as uh, for since she was in her, I guess, early 20s, um, late teens, early 20s, she has suffered from agoraphobia. And uh, I would say debilitating in m- many instances. Um, it her, definitely affects her quality of life. Definitely. Yeah. Even even to this day, although she's she's definitely made great strides and, and, and much better Absolutely. Um, than when she was younger. Um, but one of the things that, that even came out when we talked, you know, when her and I talked today was the first time she had a panic attack was in a mall, uh, which malls are horrible for agoraphobics because oh, they're open, yeah. big spaces. There's, you know, people and things sparse, everywhere. There's sparse people around though. It's not always crowded. Right. It's very sparse and, and it's just wide open, right? So second floor of, of a mall was the first time that she remembers having a panic attack. And then when she finally realized that she had developed this phobia, she realized that the that that embarrassment feel, right? The right. feel of having that panic attack compounded on itself. So every time she was in a situation where she had had a panic attack before, she was fearful that she would have a panic attack again. Right. And that's what compounds itself over and over and over again. Every time, right? If it's in a public space, she had a panic attack at the mall. Every time she goes to the mall, she fears she's going to have that. And Every time the- she's on, she's she's in, you know, walks across a parking lot. If she had a panic attack before, she's now fearful that, that she's going to have a panic attack Again. Again. And right. have to experience those symptoms and those feelings. And, you know, your mom is all is very self-conscious, too, of, of people around her judging her already. Well, that, um, but that comes from this. It's, it's, it's not chicken. I think it's chicken or the egg. Right. Because it, it all kind of comes back on itself. Because um, even things like uh, uh, being in a restaurant, right? So one of the things I remember my mother doing in a restaurant uh, was she would have this esophageal kind of like tick where Mm -hmm. she would start almost like gagging, like, you know, kind of like a a real weird kind of like reaction reaction. when we were in restaurants and speaking to her today and talking to her about it, that was a panic attack in restaurants when she was, you know, and and she would always want to be seated next to a wall Mm -hmm. because that was very important. If she ever got seated in the middle Walls of a restaurant. Walls seem to be safe for her. Always. If she can have a wall or a person that kind of creates a barrier. Big time. It, it's, Anything. It feels a little safer for Absolutely. her. Absolutely. So anytime she was felt exposed. Ooh, I love that. That was a very, very big deal. So if she felt exposed in, a, in, a, in, a, in the middle of a restaurant, like seated in the middle, that was very, a very big deal. But the esophageal thing, she would, she would when she was eating, um, she would start to get that public i don't know if it's a fear of of anxiety of whatever it was but it would it would kind of flesh itself out in this very physical way right um, which and I, haven't seen know, do, I haven't seen her do that in a long time but she used to do it a lot when i was a kid and we know that anxiety is a physical reaction you know it's not just a mental reaction it's a physical reaction and 
gender plays an important role in agoraphobia because women tend to be diagnosed more. And one of the hypotheses around this is that um, it might be the that it's related to mothers giving daughters mixed mixed messages about becoming separate individuals from themselves. So mm-hmm. maybe some enmeshment issues with um, mom may have created kind of a an insecurity with separating oneself um, and being kind of solely responsible for whatever happens. Oh, there's there's some crazy family stuff there that I can get into. I mean. <laughs> you know the, the, physi- the, the, the physical there's what also I'm... a hormonal issue probably right. too right i mean there's probably but she always felt like it was there was a hormonal aspect to it there has to be because our hormones tie in so tightly with um what goes on with our neurochemistry in our brain um and our gut is so connected to our brain and i know your mom has gut issues too we just talked about that um, we talked about that today too exactly and so all of these things are at play here and you can't just say like well one is the other it's it's all of them at once um at play setting the stage for you know this anxiety response to kind of enact itself yeah i think you know it's it's what's really interesting uh about the you know we talked about the genetic aspect a little bit so my grandmother she had she definitely had agoraphobia um but it was the 1940s and 50s and whatever and it wasn't you know, I'm sure well known and it wasn't, you know, actively uh, diagnosed the right way. Um, but she would always sit in the back, make them sit in the back of church so she could escape. Escape was a big deal, mm-hmm. right? Feeling that security of being able to slip out of a situation in right. public, right? In social situations. She was not a fan of social situations. Um, and it, and it, during my mother's uh, high school years, she ended up at a hospital in Nashville Um and my mom still doesn't know exactly what for, but mm-hmm. she was gone for, for a, a significant period of time. And back then, mental health was not exactly, Right. You, know, you didn't broadcast it. No. You know, my grandfather was a was the president of a bank and a very you know wealthy, well-to-do kind of guy in town. So I'm sure it was, we're going to send you off to this hospital and to I'm, get better. And I'm sure, it was a nervous, I'm sure it was some sort of nervous breakdown, but it, it was related, I'm sure, to this. But I, I wonder you know, how your mom's relationship with her mom and her mom's relationship with her own anxiety impacted your Huge. mom's relationship Watching with it, her anxiety. Right? Watching it and seeing it firsthand. Uh, and then experiencing out. that separation anxiety because when, as a person who is wildly anxious myself, when you're anxious, you're very inward. Mm-hmm. And others can perceive that as, as neglect, neglect or, or distancing. Distance or coldness. Uh, yeah, coldness. Right? Um, and then as a child, you're more likely to reflect it inward. Like, well, it must be something with me. Oh, yeah. And that makes you more God, That anxious. triggers something that we else, something else we talked about that, that was totally separated. But <laughs> uh, I'd love to talk to her about that too. But um, So we had, we had grandmother, right? My grandmother. Um, so my mom's mom. And her sister. So her sister... Uh, was so so agoraphobic that my mother had to go help take care of her up in Kentucky when her husband, uh, they were newly married, had to have a tumor removed out of his nose um, and it was in the hospital for a few days. She refused to drive. Mm-hmm. So my mom had to drive up and help take care of her during that period of time. Uh, this was before I think my mom even had uh, had those those symptoms. Sure. Um, but she ended up being very agoraphobic uh, all the way through her life to this day um, and being much more, she had much more of those kind of housebound right. kind of deal for, 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 for big periods of time. And when life is more stressful, those symptoms tend to escalate too. And you tend to see more withdrawal and more isolation and more and less, um, less ability to, go outside the comfort zone because you've literally got no, you've got no emotional spoons left because right. you're just so anxious all the time that you spend all of those, uh, anxiety spoons, um, just trying to feel safe in your own, in your own self. It's crazy. It's, it's a very crazy concept, um, from people who have never experienced it. Um, but as talking, like talking to my mom, I realized that I have had, a whole plethora of of these similar experiences and sure. never had put a had never had put my finger on the fact that 
that was what was going on. Oh, gosh. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So I had never thought about this in terms of like things that I experienced. I had experienced in college. So when I was in college, I always had to sit in the back of the room. Mm -hmm. If I came into a classroom and there was only one seat left in the front or in the middle, I would skip class. And if I absolutely had to make attendance or something and I sat in the middle... It affected my my gastrointestinal tract and but you're my such, stomach. But you're and... such a social person. What was it about those particular classroom situations that was so so much more vulnerable than going out to you know a club or a party or whatever? And fear being... fear of embarrassment. So because I, that was a quiet silence. Setting. Silence. Oh. Quiet. If the, someone could hear your stomach, they'd think you farted. They think you're gross. You're the well, that dude was, that... And that was, but that, and that was just a symptom, though. To, right. Because the fear had come before that somehow. So I don't know where that came from, but that was just a symptomatic thing that came up later that made it even worse, right? Because right. Because then panic. Right. Right? When your stomach starts like, gurgling. Because then you're like, oh my gosh. Yeah, your stomach starts gurgling and you get panic, right? And so that's where the fear comes up. So my mom was relating uh, a story. She gave me two or three different stories of like her worst Experiences, experiences with ever. agoraphobia. And she even said like, great, thanks for bringing all this shit up. Like now... I'm... This is good for her. It's it's minor exposure therapy. And, you know, I mean, you really should have put her in the hand of a trained therapist. But I'm really interested to hear that call conversation. So she, yeah, this, the conversation actually was really great. Maybe, oh God, if we had a Patreon, that'd be great. I could just play the whole, the right. whole conversation. People could listen to it. Um, maybe we should do that um, at some point. But she was talking about how uh, Long Beach Airport in Southern California. I don't know if you ever flew out of Long Beach. No. Um, but Long Beach was very similar to Ontario. Did you ever fly out of yeah, Ontario? Yeah, all the time. Okay. And what what did you have to do at Ontario Airport? Do you uh, remember? You had to park and you walked to the gate. And then and then where'd you then then what about the? Oh, then you walked out onto the runway. You had to walk out onto, like... the, onto the tarmac, right? So <laughs> yeah. if you like, if if you have ever experienced that walking out on the tarmac thing it's you know you get you get checked in you give you your ticket and then you walk out and you walk up the stairs up to the airplane um long beach airport my mom was going somewhere by herself so my dad had to leave her at the you know at the gate um before you know before 9 11 mm-hmm. so she would walk her to the gate but then she had to walk the tarmac by herself right and she remembers sitting there waiting for the plane to arrive and the fear of walking out on the tarmac was just pumping in her brain, right? Like just reverberating. It was just a con- this constant conversation she was having internally about the fear of, of just what's going to happen between the gate and the stairs. Right. That's how fearful she is of walking in an open space, right? So, so when time came for her to, to, to go out onto the tarmac, uh, she stopped right at the gate. And, and wouldn't walk any further. And, and then... She was just frozen. She was frozen, which was, a, which was another thing. That's, that's a very big thing that happens. An anxiety she literally response, just yeah. It's a fight um, or flight instinct, so... So what she did was there was a couple that was walking, that had just walked out behind her, and she nudged them and said, hey, like, she explained to them, this was probably in the late 70s, early 80s, um, explained to them, hey, I'm agoraphobic. Can I walk... Wow. Can I walk with you? to the stairs um, and they looked at her like she was an alien because oh. back then nobody really knew what, right. knew what the hell this people shit was. Did, people weren't educated. They weren't educated as, as well and so but they did. They let her you know walk you know with her um, but she said the whole time I just wanted to grab onto both of them but she's like I just oh. walked behind them with my head down and made it to the stairs and then got on the plane. I would love know? to explore further like just how I mean I know obviously she's got a genetic predisposition that makes her more vulnerable to this but you know, just what things activate her and um, where it began. And I mean, I guess it began at the mall, but I just would Well, it began at the mall, more. but it, it became, it, it began way earlier. Right. I mean, it began, began in various forms. I mean, obviously, like you said, I think there's a little bit of of nature versus nurture. This is a genetic thing that's that's in the family. My uncle is a, is a, is a preacher, mm-hmm. you know, at a church in Kentucky um, but he had agoraphobia, and he he actually defeated the you know defeated or or, Kenneth? or dealt yeah Kenneth um, dealt with the phobia through that's a good guy through literally like like just 
diving into the worst possible thing you could do, which is standing in front of, uh, you know, 800 people or whatever. Right. And, and, you know, because this phobia comes from genetics experiences and like different psychological traits, um, that may have worked really well for him, but it might not be a great treatment for someone like your mom. Right. Um, right. you know, different, uh, different strokes for different folks, so to say, you know, but, um, one thing that I did discover while I was researching this, that kind of, got me thinking about your mom was um, benzodiazepines, Xanax, Mm -hmm. um, often prescribed as an anti-anxiety medication for panic disorders, right? Um, But when you try to get off of it and and decrease your use Mm -hmm. of it, it actually increases symptoms of agoraphobia. So, you know, it's interesting. My mom has always been very skeptical of, well, not skeptical, but very scared of being dependent on... On drugs. Mm-hmm. So a really interesting example between her and her sister, um, her sister kind of dove into that and needed much higher doses and a lot of right. various medications to, to, to stabilize. We her, know benzos are short to term. stabilize her, her phobia. My mother has never taken much more than, I don't think I can remember very many times that she ever took a whole pill. Right. So she was prescribed Xanax. You know what she was prescribed initially, though? Was Valium. Darvacet. Oh, Darvacet. Oh, Valium as well, but that was later. But Darvacet initially, which has now, I believe, been... As a Schedule 1? It's been... De- no, it's been, been banned by the FDA. I don't Ooh. think it's even available anymore. Jeez. Um, for various reasons. So, yeah, this... this... Phobia is definitely the most debilitating. And even when you try to get help through medication or therapy, um, you know, it only shows about a 90% success rate, which is less than others. Um, Because it's not, it's not about, and this is what she said too. um, It's not about, she doesn't believe that the Xanax has much effect on her anymore because she literally only takes a half a pill every time. Um, She believes it's totally placebo. Yeah. It is the thing that she does when she knows that she needs to calm down. Right. Because it's all about calming yourself down. When she's had terrible panic attacks, this story is terrible. Um, she had an ex-business partner who was actually her best friend at the time. Um, and they were helping run a jogathon, uh, which was a fundraiser at my school when I was a kid, elementary school. Um, and my mom, and it was out in a big field, obviously, you know, the school field. So it was out in a big field. And she had told this woman, I won't mention her name, Beth, <laughs> um, that she was, you know, she, she knew about her phobia, right? So they had to do, there was something before the jogathon, she had to walk across the field with Beth to go to the other side, to go to the table or whatever, the fence. And so they walked halfway across the field and Beth decided it would be hilarious to run away. And leave her in the middle of the field oh, with nobody man. around. This is one of the experiences she said was her absolute greatest fear in the world, right? You're surrounded by all these other PTA moms, which are already horrible jackals, uh, you know, horrible hyenas to, to begin with. Right. Um, and then she leaves you in the middle to be, embar- you know, th- that embarrassment feeling. To right? be susceptible to the embarrassment. To this, to this, yeah, to this feeling that you get. And she said she shut down completely. Like she just froze Panic attack set in. She had to. She believed she sat down in the middle of the field, and just like didn't know she, she made a cry. She Your was brain just... literally shuts off everything else and goes into panic mode and goes into emergency fight flight mode. Like it, it dumps so much into your brain and so many neurotransmitters go and so so much happens all at once that it you do shut down. And everything. It just debilitates everything. It is so debilitating. Um, And so the fact that this phobia is so debilitating for so many is is really, really fascinating. Yeah, it's crazy. So she, so she, after that, she, she was helped out by somebody else, but her friend was just laughing off to the side, thought it was hilarious. Which is not cool. I mean, if somebody's having a phobic level reaction, that's, that's nothing to, you know, poo-poo about. No. It's very serious, and it's causing very serious, very real symptoms. And honestly, like, I, I feel like if, if there's people who are, who have phobias out there, and they have debilitating phobias, my mom is a really good case study for somebody who has really learned to find devices to function well with her, within her phobia. She's got tools. She's really learned to have tools. She's parking lots. 
are terrible for my mom. Right. So if I if I park with my mom, I'll forget even now. But, She's asked me to walk with but, her. But before. yeah, she'll grab your arm and she'll walk with you across the parking lot, you know, across it until you get to the sidewalk or you get to the other side. Um, cause she's still, that's still a very real thing for her. But if she's by herself, she's going grocery shopping. She's learned that if she just gets a, if she finds a shopping cart, she'll park next to the shopping cart. If she has the sharp shopping cart in her hand, it feels, it feels like she has something to walk. With. If she has to walk without a shopping cart, she'll wait till a car passes and she'll walk along behind the car to go across the street. Wow. She has so, so many mechanisms to not, to, to, to deal with it, to, yeah, to, overcome and, and kind of do everyday activities but I wonder how many things she's said no to just because of the anticipation of getting into a situation sure. that might enact this I'm sure back in the day it was, it was really bad and, and and you know alcohol plays a part too you know and things certain things with we're talking about gut and gut the health things and we put, brain health we put in our body so gut health brain health like you were saying is a big deal so if you have alcohol the day before, right? And you're get, you get super drunk the night before. The next day, you're going to have a bad day. And she'll tell you that. Like, she'll, she'll be like, if I get drunk the night before, I'm going to have a bad phobia day the next day. I'm going to have panic attacks. I'm going to have problems yeah. if I go out of the house. You know, I know that. Her brain's ability to moderate those panic symptoms is just reduced, you know? It, it's reduced after alcohol consumption or maybe something emotional that drains you of it. And you just, you don't have the the faculties left to kind of hold back that panic and yeah. so it overrides your rational system and it's very alarming and exhausting yeah it's so tiring having to deal with that all the time yeah. and you know it's interesting and and this not to digress but but as far as the development of these things you know it seems like you, you were saying there's some genetic predisposition and there's some things that i've realized now like i have some of that myself right i, I like we right. talked about um now I've I think I've I think I've had the ability because we live in a I live in a time where we're we're educated a little better about these things and we we, we can kind of look back on them and I can go oh that makes sense I had this this thing my mom though she looks back and she goes well you know what like this instance or these these environmental factors help lead up to this thing like she was saying with her sister her sister had a kidney issue in high school. Um, where she had to go to the bathroom all the time. And so in high school, she had to she had to constantly be excusing herself to go to the bathroom, right? Which is an embarrassing thing. Um, that Especially then, as you get into pre-adolescence right, and as adolescence. Right, as you're in those those really tough times, right? And my mom also That's had a lot of those tough times. damn shame monster development, right? Yeah, there's something it, in there. Well, in the research, it says, you know, 15 to 35 is that kind of age group. And think about that. That's, for women specifically, that's a huge shifting period of uh, hormones and brain chemistry, right. you know, as you go into menstruation and then you fall out and, you know, there's a lot going on and, yeah. and that definitely impacts things. So there's, so, so there's more than, so these things can just develop from these, these very environmental uh, situations that happen. These, these, these kind of crisis periods that happen. Um, and I think it's really interesting Two, she felt like after she got a hysterectomy in the in like the early 80s after I was born, that her symptoms, she felt like her symptoms got better. Hmm. Which again, hormonal. I'd have to look further. What, There's so many different factors. There is. That's you know? why that's why phobias can't be, you know, phobias and panic disorders and anxiety disorders can't be put down to one thing. You know, there is a genetic predisposition that makes you more vulnerable. There's also a lot that has to do with environment that plays into your body and your brain's reaction to things that makes you susceptible to having a panic disorder. And then if something very traumatic happens, well, crap, who wouldn't develop some right. sort of it's way even, to cope it, it just with blows it, it, you know? You know? Um, so, even yeah. More. This this is a There's really There's so much that we could I mean I just I could talk about this for so long. I but... know it really hits home for you in a yeah, lot of ways. Yeah, and, and, and honestly, like I've felt that panic attack feeling. I've had that that feeling before. Um and it's really it's a really strange thing to look back on it and go, Oh, that's what I was feeling. Like, Do that's any of your other siblings struggle? Oh my gosh, yes, my sister is is definitely agoraphobic. No no doubt about it. My what brother about probably has it to a certain extent. Keith does? I think so to a certain extent, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um and a lot of that kind of fleshes itself out in different ways because we I think all of us grew up with it, so we sure. we have an understanding of it. So we 
we've been able to kind of self-treat it in different ways. But Heath and Heather grew up with it alone with your mom, essentially, for a, a, a while. Not um, really. Not really? No, not really. I mean, they were, you know, they were babies when she married you so know, married trying, my dad. So, so I was trying to think of the, they're very young. the genetic impact but, but on they having... definitely, But they definitely had it at a time when she was younger, and it was much more... Well, she Acute, was she was divorced you know. and you know a single mom and that that yeah, increases sure. all of the symptoms and everything. So I wonder yeah. if that. But even a role. even even when I was young, like in my in my and we've had conversations about this, my siblings and I. But um, when I was little, we'd be driving down the freeway, the five freeway in Southern California, and she would start grabbing her shoulder, mm -hmm. and you knew that she was having a panic attack, and she would pull over on the freeway. Oh, the side of the road so and, have, terrifying. and have to sit there and wait and, and wade through her panic attack, you know, and, and fumble through to a bottle of, you know, and pull out a, a Xanax, you know, and, and, and then calm herself down and then She's start up again. She's been through so much. Like, and then her, wow. and then and there were times she'd have to call, she would be so frozen that she had to call my dad to come pick her up. I mean, those were, those were things that, and so she has come so far you know, in, you know, now that she's, she's older, she's, she's really learned to deal with it in so many different ways. It's so. amazing. Great stuff. Yeah. Good. I mean, great phobia information, I think. Yeah. It's really, really interesting stuff just to find out, um, how prevalent this is and, and what happens in the mind. I even asked my mom about movies too. So now transition into movies. Ha, yes. I was like, what movies do you think have really like Bring it out in you. Bring out this, or... or bring out this, this, uh, this, this concept for you. And she's like, I can't think of any that really, like, you know, really hit home as far as, you know, nailed what I felt or, or demonstrated it, you know, properly. Um, so, you know, I found though a few movies that dealt with the phobia um, very directly, um, and uh, and we're gonna dive into those now. So our movies, I'm going to breeze through these because honestly, like our, our content. You struggled with it. It just, there was, you know, there wasn't anything and growing up with it, you know, growing up with movies. I'm sorry, growing up. With, growing up with movies. Growing up with movies. Oh man. Growing up with, uh, agoraphobia. around, around agoraphobia and knowing kind of what it was. Um, I never saw it in its most extreme form, which I think these movies kind of play on, you know, the whole concept of, of the, the shut agoraphobic shut-in, right? The person who won't leave their house. Um, but I did experience it to a certain degree because there were days my mom didn't leave the house for four or five days. Yeah, you experienced you know? it So I did experience hand. it, but it wasn't the same. But I did find a couple of movies that I liked. For um, the viewers. Yeah. Um, I did have a couple of honorable mentions that I, I wanted to bring up. Um... You know, just some real quick ones. So the quick ones, there's always, I think we're going to do like, we're going to do like the quick ones. And then there's like the one that I'm going to kind of focus on mm -hmm. for honorable mentions. And then like the feature presentation. Okay. That's that what makes sense. That's kind of where we're going nowadays. Seems balanced. <laughs> um, but our, as far as like a couple that came to mind and I, and, and, we, and you've seen some of these horror movies slash phobia articles where they, they hook a phobia up with a movie. Um, they go, oh, this is the best movie for... Yeah, I sent you, know, you one. Yeah, I, I, and I had already read the one that you sent me because um, I've gone through a bunch of these because they're they're good. Um, they're they're kind of good to kind of get a a, a... a handle on a, it. A base, you know, basic kind of understanding of, of where some of these movies might be. Um, I don't think they always do a great job of picking the right movies. Um, which is why I didn't pick either of these movies, but I kind of understood where they were going with them. Right. Um, one of the honorable mentions that I saw pop up in one of these lists was The Hills Have Eyes mm -hmm. by Wes Craven, which Living in Nevada, this is like our, it's like our home horror movie. Wasn't it filmed here? Uh, I think, I don't know if they ended up filming it here, but it was definitely supposed to take place in the Nevada desert down, I'm guessing down near the uh, Air Force Base Vegas area, not up here in beautiful northern Nevada right. that we live in. Very different people. Look it up. <coughs> Whoa. <coughs> hey, whiskey got your back. <coughs> or am I that funny? <coughs> no, I just I just had a vision of like everybody thinking Reno is Vegas. Everybody <laughs> when, does. When, when they're like, oh, I'm coming into Vegas. And, and then they, they think they can come visit you, but you're eight hours You're like, cool. Away. Spend your day getting to Yeah, me. it's like going to at Los Angeles and being like, oh, you live in San Francisco? I'm going to come visit cool. you. Cool. I'll come visit you in San Francisco. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't it's not work an entire way. state away. <laughs> and Don't I worry. inhaled a bunch of whiskey. Um, 
But 1977's Hills Have Eyes, uh, directed by Wes Craven. Most of you have seen this movie. Um, it is, it is, uh, it's a good one. Um, there's uh, a great, uh, uh, was it? No, um, Joe Bob Briggs does a oh. great breakdown of this for the Thanksgiving. That's right. Uh, horror marathon, I believe. Does he? Where he has a, uh, where he has a, uh, um, the main actor, uh, the gosh, what is his name? I can't even think of it right now. Um, anyways, fantastic. Check it out again. Shutter Joe Bob Briggs. Um, but the sheer horror of Wes Craven's. So this was written by Michael Rothman from Consequence of Sound. Mm-hmm. Um, put it this way. The sheer horror of Wes Craven's 1977 masterpiece, The Hills Have Eyes, is how the situation feels so inescapable. Right. For 89 minutes, we watch a poor Midwestern family suffer at the hands of a group of savages who come and go in the middle of the Nevada desert. This is their home, you see. The expansive, forgotten sands of America. Uh, apparently that's our state. Woo! The forgotten I mean, sands of America. It is 80% federal land. <laughs> that, author, that otherwise would be barren, desolate, and eerily quiet. Those suffering from agoraphobia probably don't imagine terror of this magnitude when it comes to open spaces such as these, which is why the film is paramount to their recovery, or perhaps their ultimate demise. Hmm. Come to think of it, there's no way anyone with that phobia walks away from this film film feeling cured. But numb? Maybe. Absolutely. Yeah, from watching all the abuse. It's awful. (laughs) So that was the way one person put that one. Um, and I, I can see it. I can see that. I mean, I being out it. in the middle of the desert and being in some It's kind of like open water. Right. Well, which is the next one. Oh, oh, jeez. Oh. Nice, nice transition. Yeah. Did you even know that? See, no, you've taught me well. So open water, which I don't even know what year that came out. I didn't put that down. But, um, if you haven't seen open water, it is fucking terrifying. And I wanted to, I wanted to, um, I didn't want to include it for, agor- for agoraphobia because it just, it just, um, uh, there's so many other phobias that this movie like elicits. Um, but gosh, fear yeah. Fear of sharks, if, fear of drowning. Fear of drowning, fear, fear of, of water, you know, thalass- with thalassophobia. Um, there's so many things that could that you could be afraid of in this movie. Yes, agoraphobia is one of them. Um, and it would probably be absolutely terrifying for an agoraphobic. I, I agree. But um, I, I cut out another uh, quote. Jim Varel from Paste Magazine says, uh, Open water is one of the most terrifying premises I can imagine, phobia or not. A pair of divers are left behind their guide boat and stranded in the open ocean with no idea of what direction they should even head. That's true powerlessness. Yeah. And once fatigue begins to set in... And vulnerability. Right? Um, I can't even swim. I can't tread water. (laughs) That's my nightmare. (laughs) You'd be dead. I would be dead in... 2.5 2.5 seconds. And once fatigue begins to set in, the sharks begin to circle. Oh it's my hard gosh. to imagine not completely... Because you give off like pheromones and stuff and they can smell it in you. It's hard to imagine not to be completely turning to despair. The open ocean is the ultimate terror for an agoraphobic when one realizes the sheer scale of the space underneath you, above you, and around you. And there could be, and is, anything down there. Right. I don't like that idea either. No, I don't think anybody would. No, and, and honestly, like that's why, like to me, that's terrifying. I'm like, that's why I've never seen the movie. Yes. Oh, dude, it's, it's honestly, it was it was one of the no. hardest movies I've ever watched, and I'll never forget. I watched it at um, at my aunt's house in Minnesota, um, randomly. I think I was with my ex wife. Um, we were up there. I think when 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 Hank was like a little baby. Oh, maybe I remember when you guys were watching it back here. I don't. Yeah, we were on our way to to Reno, oh. uh, but we went up to Minnesota first to visit. And I will never forget watching it because I remember being like, deeply nope, uncomfortable. Nope, 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 nope. nope. That's nope. a whole lot of nope. Nope, 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 nope. Fuck you. Nope for dinner. <laughs> nope for lunch. Lo- nope. And for I breakfast. was a surfer who has actually physically been circled by sharks. Literally happened to me um, one time when I was about sixteen years old. I was yeah. out surfing and got circled by blue sharks. Three of them. I'm good. Um, and it was a very terrifying experience. I can't imagine being without any. Just without anybody, as far as the eye can see, and being circled and just being out in the middle of nowhere. Fuck no. Hard pass. Um, but that brings us to our our actual honorable mention for today, um, which is the 2015 movie Intruders. Today's offering, meatloaf, green beans on the dean, and apple cobbler. I don't know how I'm going to do this without you. Your brother's already approved this. He's taking care of everything. I just need a signature. 
Are you gonna keep the place? Of course. This is my home. Tells me we're not the first guests here. Yeah, not like this. I have no idea what I'm like. You haven't left this house in over ten years. You'll understand soon. So Intruders was originally named Shut In, and apparently it's also gone by the, the name Deadly Home. It had um, many identities. It had many identities, because apparently they were terrible titles to choose, because there was like tons of other movies with the same titles around <laughs> the same time. So I guess the next, like the year after Shut In came out, there was a, there was a Naomi Watts movie that came out in 2016 that oh, was yeah. fucking terrible apparently but so I guess they changed their name because of that so they started calling it Intruders weird um, but it's a 2015 American horror thriller uh, directed by Adam Schindler and written by TJ Synthel and David White film stars Beth Reisgraf Rory Culkin Rory Culkin Rory Culkin um, uh, what's his name's Culkin's brother Macaulay Macaulay thank you I don't know why I couldn't think of his name because it sounds like a mouthful Younger of brother. marbles Macaulay Martin Starr uh, from Freaks and Geeks oh yeah um, he was weird in this yeah yeah he was creepy in this and then uh, and, and a guy named Jack Kessie um, and the like I said original title was Shut In um, but basically what do you think of this movie Chris I, I'm interested to, to hear because you watched this one fairly Intently. It took a weird turn, and I'll go ahead and summarize it. A uh, woman appears to be deathly afraid of leaving her home uh, after the recent death of her brother. Mm-hmm. Gets confronted by three strangers who break in because they hear she's got some dough hidden in her house now. They think she's at, at her brother's funeral, too, because it's during her brother's funeral, but she won't leave the house, so she didn't right. know. Right, so she, she didn't, didn't go, go, go. right. So, so, so they thought they were breaking of, in without her there. There's kind of the evidence of, you know, agoraphobia interfering with this woman's life, her being able to attend her brother's funeral. Um, that, you know, would be a big deal we know she hasn't left the house in 10 years she hasn't left the house in 10 years we they tell us that there's a scene where the three break in she's there they kind of torture her a little bit by dragging her out on the front porch and she has a panic attack and a very visible um physical reaction they're basically telling her to leave like right. go run away and right. she's like they don't want to kill can't. I'm gonna they don't want to like hurt her they just want her money blah 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 anyways things escalate um and spoiler alert uh, weird turn. She's got a like torture basement, um, where apparently she and her brother have been trying to reenact um the abuse that they suffered at the hand of their father in the basement. So well, well, so here's 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 what happened. So they end up these guys end up getting trapped. Uh, in the she basement, has really elaborate traps. Very elaborate, elaborate. She very, goes, very she goes from like. very, from very weak and very meek, feeble to, and to, to like, just to all like, of a sudden yeah. powerful. She she almost has a little bit of like a yeah split personality or something that takes it, over. It's just that safe feeling, like she finally feels safe because she's got the control. Yeah. And she traps, she, she killed one of them, and then she drags him downstairs to the basement, and then the other guys realize, where's our buddy? And he's down in the basement. And they run down there, and she traps them in this like very elaborate basement trap, um, including a, her a mock of her bedroom upstairs, which yeah. is her, which is really weird because it's a reenactment of the trauma that well, they suffered yes. at the hand of their father. Yes. So her brother, who had died of pancreatic cancer, apparently had what we find out is that father was abusive, right? Sexually, I'm sure, um, and physically. So brother 
ended up killing father their dad um and brother and sister conrad and anna uh end up reenacting well bringing in abusers so they're they they're, continue they're to torturing they're torturing people who are, who are child abusers right they somehow get them into their home and then they trap them in this room and then they do the same yeah. thing that they did to you know well not necessarily the same thing they did their they, father they but, kill them but they but they're, but they're yeah they're, they're doing like vengeance right? right so this is a very home invasion type horror movie but then it takes this weird like revenge uh, and they turn. never they never really tell us why the sister's a part of it like does she enjoy it because there was a part where well, she, you can tell she's smirking she broke down bit. though yeah but she's smirking at, at the beginning a, she enjoys know, it i don't know but i think there were parts of it that she enjoyed but then there were other parts of it that maybe was the brother's responsibility so she felt well less comfortable. we missed the rory culkin part a little bit because rory culkin was her delivery she had this delivery guy who would bring her food every day right who was kind of like the scout for no the, he wasn't he wasn't he the wasn't scout. no no he he was her friend and he went to the funeral of her brother and was waiting mm-hmm. for her there. Um, and then we find out that he had just mentioned that she had offered him all this money after her brother died to his brother. Oh, gotcha. I believe his brother was one of the, the, one of the, one other of the guys. three guys yeah. that came and broke in. And they, so he didn't intend any of this to happen. No, so I he knew, was, yeah. So anyways, so so they, so the Roy Culkin character um, is really kind of innocent in all of it. Right. And I I can't remember if he's he, guilty by association. I don't remember if he eyes. got out. I think he he finally escaped. She killed all the rest of the guys, but she let him escape. And at the very end, she she lights the whole place on fire. Right. So we realized that she had been there with her brother torturing abusers. But why does she light the years. place on fire? Oh, because because she had just killed all these dudes. She's killed all these dudes, and she finally and she finally had gotten over this, her agoraphobia. Like, this like relief, this like my house is no longer my safe space, or or whatever right. happened, and so she was. She was very confident. She was very yeah. confident when she walked out because I think Which, her brother was the killer before, and maybe she was the killer now, or right. I think whatever. I think something, something like, like that. that happened, or I don't know. I gotta I'm, say, I gotta say, not how it works in treatment. I re- no, it, it, it was not a probably an accurate depiction of the actual mental health uh, scenario, but it was a really interesting twist. And for a home invasion movie um, that I'm not hu- a huge fan of, like The Strangers and all those, I'm just, right. they don't really do it for me. Um, this one kind of had an interesting twist. I liked it. I liked the twist to it. And that's why when I watched it, I was like, well, yeah. hot damn, like, this isn't too bad. Um, this is one that we should probably, you know, throw out there. So if you haven't seen it, 2015's Intruders or Shut In. Or, when, when we search or, on, when we search on uh, Amazon Prime, it comes up as Shut In. But or, when I search anywhere else, it's Intruders. Agoraphobic's Revenge. <laughs> Agoraphobic's Revenge. That's what we'll call this one. <laughs> um, but that brings us to our feature presentation. And now our feature presentation. What turns on a killer is the suffering and death of another human being. And as his determination builds to take another life, he plans in obsessive detail what props he'll bring, what knots he'll tie. Let me ask you guys something. What turns you on? A criminal psychiatrist. There's a serial killer out there who strangled three women. He's going to do it again. A homicide detective. Would you work with us on this? You're kidding, right? I do not want you discussing this case with her in any shape, way, or form. It's the Boston Strangler. You're telling me this guy's copycatting a serial killer's been dead for... 20 years. You're looking for an intelligent white male, 20 to 30 years old, socially functional. Everything's different. Different guy. He's switched from DeSalvo to Bianchi and Bono, the hillside strangler. One man is copying the most notorious killers in history. One at a time. He's sending you letters like he's daring us to nail him. If he wants to be famous, he has to be caught. I'm death and life to you, Doc. We know that Mr. Cullen was safe in San Quentin last night, so how come his book shows up under the mattress? Together, two women must stop him. The man who has killed five women in the city was just in your apartment. Before he kills again. All I know to do is change your locks, tighten up your security, and pray. Sigourney Weaver, Holly Hunter, and Harry Connick Jr. in a deadly game of cat and mouse. Copy.
بودی کرد In our feature presentation is I, a movie that I had never seen before, that I'd always wanted to see because I love serial killer movies, um, but I'd never seen it before. And it's Copycat. It's a 1995's psychological thriller, not technically a horror movie. Fuck blah, you. blah, blah. Um, Suck it up, feardos. Yeah. Psychological thrillers to me are, are as horror adjacent as you can get, so I'm calling it a horror movie. Um, psychological thriller copycat 1995 directed by John Amiel John Amiel John Amiel Amiel um, composer of this though was really good I love the music in this um, and the composer was Christopher Young who uh, this is for you Metal Chris um, Christopher Young and Metal Chris is uh, Metal Chris is uh, uh, obsessed with horror scores um, he's our resident horror score horror score expert uh, expert yeah yeah sommelier um, <laughs> our horror score sommelier <laughs> Um, Christopher Young is, if, if you know anything about horror scores, you know he's kind of a legend. He did uh, Hellraiser, he did Species, Drag Me to Hell, The Grudge, and a bunch of other big blockbuster movies too. Um, he did the music for this and it's it's really good. And it actually does really help the 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 feel of the movie. I actually, right. I literally noticed it and I don't always notice the music, but I did notice You noticed notice it. that it made you tense or that you were feeling the emotions in your body because of the music. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, this movie is uh, Sigourney Weaver, mm-hmm. who, fuck yeah, mm-hmm. as Helen Hudson, who is basically a criminologist, criminal psychologist. Um, and we have Holly Hunter, also awesome, um, as an inspector, Inspector uh, Monahan. We have Dermot Mulroney, who plays Meow. Ruben Giotz, or Giotz, 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 Giotz. Um, and then we have Harry Connick Jr. Me. Freaking yeah. As a serial killer, Meow. or as a killer, as a psycho killer, Daryl Lee Cullum. Daryl Lee Cullum. Daryl Lee Cullum. Ugh. Uh, Ugh. And it's a great, I freaking, I love Harry Connick. It's a good anyway. cast. He, he is so good. He's, it was he's a re- such a good actor. He was so good in this too. Like I was, I was pretty surprised um, at how attractive he is as a fake serial as a crazy, killer. As a crazy killer? Yeah. Crazy redneck serial killer? Yep. Um, I think this may have been one of his very first big kind of movie roles if I remember right and then he did quite a few after this um what if Harry Connick Jr. is one of the mass singers I don't think so no 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 okay no I'm not I'm I'm not buying that no we shouldn't be watching that reality show anyway no I love it I'm addicted you're addicted too (laughs) anyways so (laughs) so copycat Let me give you a quick rundown. After giving a guest lecture on criminal psychology at a local university, Dr. Helen Hudson, our Sigourney Weaver character, a respected field expert on serial killers, is cornered in the restroom of the lecture hall by one of her previous subjects, Daryl Lee Cullum, who kills a police officer and brutally attacks her. Helen then becomes severely agoraphobic as a result, sealing herself inside an expensive high-tech apartment, conducting her entire life from behind a computer screen and assisted by a friend, Andy. If you don't mind, I have a very busy day. Well, ma'am, it's a hell of an apartment you got here. Hell of an apartment. I guess the books you wrote about these scumbags must have paid pretty well. Now, we can't afford to pay you your usual fee, but you would be so kind as to look. I don't want these. Would you be more comfortable looking at them downtown? I don't want to see these here. Well, I'll drive you if you prefer. Andy. Andy! 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 Sorry. It's okay. Wait. Wait, I'm here. Wait. Wait. Should we call the paramedics? No, no. Just a good old-fashioned panic attack. She hyperventilates till she passes out, then her breathing returns to normal, and she's fine. What do we do? She's agoraphobic. She's afraid of spiders, too? She hasn't been out of the house in over a year. She's okay, though, right? She's fine. Half an hour, she'll be singing like a lark. Tell her we're sorry to have bothered her. Did you want her to look at those? You really do leave them. I'll make sure they're safe. Tell her to call me if she feels like it. So then, you know, when we pick back up, 
she's she she's agoraphobic and she is and there's a lot of scenes where you know in this beginning of this movie where she after she has this traumatic experience where she's almost killed she then is locked in her big fancy apartment she goes to her safe space and she cannot even walk out the door to get the newspaper like the newspaper was too far away from her door and she had to crawl she's just like fuck it and they're seeing you know seeing tunnel vision and all that stuff which my mom said she never saw she said she just would get frozen some people experience different symptoms very very different i'm sure yeah um but she's still fascinated by by her field of study right so she's which is fascinating which is fascinating um, so she starts calling the, the investigators, um, basically leaving crank, well, not telling who she is and saying, I have information about this killer, blah, blah, blah. And they're investigating multiple different crimes and she's saying that they're all related. Mm-hmm. And finally. They listen. Yeah. Finally, our Holly Hunter, you know, homeboy, uh, uh, Dem- Dermot Mulrooney. That's a really hard name to Dermot say. Dermot Mulrooney. Dermot. 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 Dermot Mulrooney um, finally decided to go visit her. And she's like, I'm too old for this shit. Ain't getting back in the game. <laughs> but you know, secretly she's like, man, I'm you so know, pumped. Because she's, I'm ready to get back in She can't this. leave her house, but she's, she's very, she, she, gets, she, to... gets, she has an agoraphobic reaction, which we played in that clip. That was when they, when they showed up. Um, and eventually, right, they start, they start, she starts investigating this with them. They start coming over to her house. They start investigating these things with, with her. Um, and finally, they realize that this assailant, this serial killer, is copying famous serial killers, right? So Which is such a cool... He started with Albert Del DeSalvo, who was the, the Boston Strangler, mm-hmm. right? And then he moved on to the Hillside Stranglers, which was two guys, right? Bueno and uh, who the hell was the other guy uh, who did Hillside? Um, Bianchi? Bianchi and, 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 and You're asking me Bono? a name? I think that's who. I don't get names, I'm pretty man. sure that's who. Uh, who Those are the, in and out of my guys. head so quick. Um, Bianchi and Bono. Bueno? Bueno? Bono? Bono? I don't know. I'm pretty sure those were the guys. Um, and then on to David Berkowitz mm-hmm. and then et cetera, right? And finally, when he goes to Jeffrey Dahmer, right? He's in a gay club and they realize like he's going to strike, you know, they realize he's going to go toward to, he's, a, he's, he's, they know mimicking, the pattern. he's mimicking Dahmer. So he's going to go to a gay club to pick up a And a they gay know guy. what Dahmer did. So then they can right. kind of follow or, you know, try and predict what's going to happen next. And then finally, uh, towards the end, he's going to do Bet Bundy, which is, I believe the murder, her murder is supposed to be kind of like a like a Bundy murder. Mm-hmm. Um, so he comes after her. There's all this crazy shit that goes on, blah, blah, blah. Um, ultimately, at the end, we realize old Harry Connick Jr., who's in jail at this point, because he was the one who attacked her, uh-huh. um, has been pulling the strings all along. Right. So he's the one he who's was been the one contacting who, outside, these outside guys. He was the one guys. who traumatized her in the beginning that made her a recluse. Recluse. Right. And then he got and he got arrested. He got arrested, of course. Right. Went to jail. Went to jail, but now is like puppeteering all of all this this, this shit. other serial killer and this other serial. So they didn't. And then she realizes she actually realizes after uh, I believe Berkowitz, Berkowitz or Dahmer when he when he was mimicking either Berkowitz or Dahmer that she was that that this killer was was actually going through this list from the lecture she gave the night she was attacked. Ew. So she mentioned this serial killer, this serial killer, right. this killer. And that was the list he was someone going through. Someone took notes. The same, the so same someone list. someone in that crowd. So it was, but it was, it was, it was Harry Connick Jr. It was Harry who had, Connick who, Jr. Who had relayed this information to somebody else and said, you should, you know, and somehow orchestrated this puppeteer. Damn it, Harry Con. Yeah. So I actually really enjoyed this movie. It was movie. a great movie. I love, I, I mean, liked it. honestly, I really feel like this movie should be remade. It'd be a fucking great nowadays remake. i think it would be executed a little more cleanly yeah because it, it, it it's such had a that, great concept it kind of had that 90s yes ni- uh, uh what's it, what's her name like, ashley judd yes. kind of feel to it right ashley judd morgan freeman kind right. of serial killer movie double feel. jeopardy yeah it kind of had that kind of feel to it yeah. even actually a little bit maybe even earlier than that and then it and then it also had a lot of like you know you were like well, they didn't have the internet back then. It was kind of cool to see like 95 
internet because oh. there was a lot of internet in this movie. There's a lot more internet than I thought, yeah. but they could afford the big. I mean, computers. I remember I remember jerking off to uh, to the old AOL, but oh, it took man. a long time. It took a long time for those things to load up. You know, it was, TMI. It was forever. TMI. There's no TMI on this podcast. <laughs> we did poultry geist. That's true. Ugh. So. But I kind of enjoyed this. It was it was a fun little movie, and honestly, if you haven't seen it, um, I take I, a watch. I rank it up. Even there if with... you don't like horror, I think you'll really enjoy this. It's, yeah, it's horror adjacent. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely the in the in the tr- true crime thriller type feel vibe to it. But it was, you know, it, was, it wasn't that much different than like Silence of the Lambs or right. or any of those you know any of those. Which kind some of people would categorize that as a thriller, psychological thriller. But yeah, it's fucking whatever. Horror. And the, uh, honestly, like the only difference between this and and that movie is that he, you know, he keep was, your evidence for the he, semantics dome. He was Evie a, White. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Evie White reference. Evie White semantics reference. Nice job. Um, yeah, no, seriously, it was it was it was the only difference between this and and Sons of the Lambs is that he was a cannibal. Right. This was actually probably gorier, um, but it was good, good watch. It was a good watch. Yeah. So. As far as agoraphobia goes, um, it definitely had that like housebound, fearful, couldn't leave the preventing, house. Preventing, you know, you know trauma, into... trauma related, right. um, phobic disorder. You know, it, it represented that well, and you know, she was bound to the house, so she had these barriers that she had to overcome, overcome. in order, yeah. you know, to figure out this mystery. So it was, it was a good one. Yeah, not bad. Um, but I think our our topic was was good, man. It yeah. was really interesting. It really dove into my. My uh, my psyche. I really. It loved, really fucked up my psyche. I know that. I really loved hearing all of the stories, and I think more in the future we need to gather more stories from outside sources firsthand, and um, you know, well, be able to share those mom. with the masses. I know we got to start off with, you know, the people closest to us. Um, but you know, are you feeling emotionally raw? It was it was really interesting to talk to her today about some of the stuff. I did. I honestly did not know. Uh, a number of the stories and, and things that she told about her childhood and things like that. It was really interesting. Um, so I'm really glad that I got a chance to, to kind of interview her on it. Cause she was, she was like, wow, really? Like this is, you know, well, let's, let's, let's dive in, you know, here's the, the background. And, um, well, homework for the week folks, ask your parents what they're most afraid of yeah. and explore further. Yeah. And just family history in general, you know, cause it's so, it's so, there's so much stuff that's lost. I mean, um, uh, that gets lost between generations oh, that you yeah. don't realize, you know, and I, I've always been, I've always been kind of hyper aware of that cause I love history in general. So I've, I've always been really into kind of diving into that stuff. And we're um, able to know now more than we ever have about the influence of uh, genetics mm-hmm. and nutrition and trauma on, you know, development of all kinds. Yeah. So, uh, cool, cool stuff. I really enjoyed it. This, this was very, it was very cathartic for yeah. me and, and, uh, the family stuff. So, Good. um, I don't even know what our next phobia is. Do you? No. I'm going to look it up real quick because I honestly don't know what the next one is. Just for a little probably, preview. Probably check it out. Um, we are on, ooh, uh, Eichmophobia, A-I-C-H-M-O, phobia, which is the fear of needles or pointed objects. Oh gosh, I already know what scene I want an honorable mention to be. We'll save that for next time. Yes. Let's, let's, uh, let's tease that. Because um, we're gonna do the fear of needles or pointed objects Oof. next, and uh, and for all you feardos out there, here's what you should do: stay afraid, stay very afraid.